Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one terry ryan Terry was the program coordinator for the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, Washington State University from 1981 until 1994. The programs involved the study of the human-animal bond and implementation of animal-assisted activity slash therapy programs. Terry has been coaching people to train their dogs since 1966. She trained her own dogs for various performance events and was an AKC obedience trial judge for many years. Terry built and operated a large training complex in Washington State. Legacy Canine Behaviour and Training Incorporated promotes humane and effective dog training techniques for a variety of pet, working dog and competitive applications. Terry maintains a busy national and international workshop schedule, most frequently teaching instructors courses, chicken training workshops and training games events. Terry is a faculty member of the Karen Pryor Academy, teaching several classes a year in the USA and overseas and she is on the staff of Clicker Expo. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Terry Ryan to the show today, who is patiently waiting by. Terry, how are you? Hello. Good afternoon. I'm great, Ryan. Good morning here in New Zealand. We yeah. are talking to each other from opposite sides of the planet today, which is always very exciting. And I'm really excited to connect with you, Terry. We met each other in, I oh, don't know what year it was, 2013? Way back then, yes. And you were visiting it- New Zealand. Yes. And I uh, came to your dog. Way before I w- had a dog, I was interested in dog stuff, and I was working at the zoo, but I was just interested in training. So it's fun to come along and and see Terry Ryan uh, in Wellington, New Zealand. And that impressed me, Ryan, that a zoo guy would come to my workshop. Yeah, it was fun, and I remember we did some activities, and I, you said, any volunteers? And I very promptly threw my <laughs> hand up in the air. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> and got to come up and um, play some games with you. But let's dive into the first question today, Terry. Could you please take us all back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and share with the listeners uh, some stories from that time and some of the first animals you ever trained using it? Oh, Well, if we wanted to go way back, I guess I would have to say I started in elementary school. There was this little black stray dog in the school ground, and he seemed to want to play with me and my friends. My friends kept chasing him away, but every day for a couple of days he was there, I decided he could be my dog, and I would take him home. But by then, he wasn't real sure about kids because they were all being mean to him. So I really wanted a dog at that time, and my parents really didn't want me to have one. So I decided to save some of my sandwich from my lunch. That's a big deal for me because I'm quite the happy eater. Um, 
and he, in quotes, followed me home. My parents still weren't very happy, so I did what every smart kid would do, and I threw a temper tantrum. And this is the truth. They actually let me keep him, and that was Smokey, my first dog that followed me home because of food. And you learned that temper tantrums worked. That too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what did you say the name of the dog was? I called him Smokey because he was black, not very original. He was a cocker-type cross, and he stayed with us for very, very many years. He was my first dog. And so intuitively you knew that sandwich might be uh, an appropriate method or tool or stimulus to get Smokey to follow you home. <laughs> it was a good guess, Ryan. <laughs> And then, and then, following on from that, was that was in that period of your life in elementary school, young Terry Ryan? Were you then starting to think about other things you could use food for at home, or did Smokey just kind of come into your home and become a pet dog, and you didn't really think about training till later? When did you start to learn about positive reinforcement and training per se? Well, officially, I took a college course an operant lab, and we had rats in Skinner boxes to train. So that was my next real experience. So this is, this is going up to your uh, late teens, early 20s? Yes, yes, uh-huh. That's and so, right. And so you took, a, you took a college course. So you got, a, you got a qualification in behavior at that time? I did not get a qualification in behavior. I was an undergraduate and signed up for all the courses that I thought would be interesting to me in dog training because by then I was already doing some dog training. And what, and so with that dog training you're already doing then, what learning had you done up until that point? Was this college course uh, reinforcing the things that you had already started doing with your dogs or did it kind of bring a whole new wave of information oh, to Oh, it was a whole new wave, Ryan. I learned terms and names that I'd never heard before and thinking, oh, why didn't I think of that? Or, hey, I'm already doing that. I didn't know whether there was a term for it. And this this was in your, you were, you were starting to be a vet at this time, is that correct? I, at that point in my life, I worked for the dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Washington State University, and I was a mom. All right. Very important job, the most important yep. job, applying positive reinforcement of your young ones at home. Yes. And it, and so you're already training dogs. You're at a university as an undergraduate doing these college courses and uh, operant learning with, with what I can only imagine was a very fun experience with some rats and Skinner boxes and stuff. And then what, ha what happened after then? What was the next step in your training journey? Well, at that point, like many of us, I ran across the book, Don't Shoot the Dog, in the 80s. And uh, I actually made contact with Karen in Hawaii. And uh, that really uh, got me hooked, Ryan. A little bit later, Karen moved to Washington State. And I was delighted when she contacted me. And we actually did a couple of workshops in the early days together, very peripheral to Karen, but I was there. So I must say that at that time, I started thinking more and more, not only about positive reinforcement training, but with training with a marker. At that time, Karen was using a whistle. Later, she started using a clicker. She gave me my first clicker little metal thing that I cut my finger on, as I remember. And so just going back to this time, which is which is amazing, and it's so cool to get these stories from you. You went to Hawaii, <laughs> you met Karen, and then she moved to Washington State. Can you can you share some stories with the listeners from this time? Was, is there any animals or experiences with Karen from that point in your life, any stories that stick out to you? Well, I just remember lots of stories that Karen told, stories about her days in Hawaii and s surfing ponies. And 
I remember she uh, talked about her first experience. She didn't set out to be a marine mammal trainer. She uh, was thrust into that job by her husband, Tap Pryor, who acquired a marine mammal facility. And she said she trained those animals with a, a Skinner paper in one hand and a fish in the other. <laughs> and she gave you your first clicker. So you, what what was a click, what were clickers like at that in that time? How did like where, how did they come about? Like where was well, the, at my first introduction with that one, it was a party favor that children might find in their uh, party favor bag at a birthday party. It was little. It was metal. It was called a cricket, and if you didn't be really really careful, you could hurt yourself on it. And do you know do you know who started? using these party favors first. I've never really thought about this, but it's quite um, interesting. In the, I have read an article that the uh, American Armed Forces used clickers, not the party favor clickers, but prior to that, metal clickers to uh, communicate with each other in code, especially the parrot troopers did that. I've read that paper. And then do you think that use led to the use of animals or do you think it was someone understanding the concept, picking um, up a party favour? <laughs> if, if I had to guess, I would guess that Keller and Marion Breland were the first ones to actually use a clicker. But that is a guess, but I think it's a pretty good guess. Not sure, Ryan. And then, and then so after this, so... Karen moved to Washington State, gave you your first clicker. You unfortunately had an incident on it and <laughs> probably grateful for the uh, redesign of that device over the years. Yep. Uh, what was next? What happened next? Oh, let's see. So at that time, I uh, had a lively German Shepherd intact male that I was trying to train and was training successfully. He could do lots of different tricks by the time he was four months old. I was really happy about that. And then the girl that lived across the streets with a miniature poodle said, I'm taking Ruffy to an obedience class. Why don't you and Hancho, that was the name of my first German shepherd, come with me? And I said, oh, he doesn't need any obedience lessons but I'll go with you just to keep you company. It might be fun. I'm curious. So I showed up at the obedience class. They were called obedience classes then, not training classes. And then quickly found out that this wonderful dog, I thought of him as Rin Tin Tin. That was one of the early TV movie shows. I found out that he was very dog reactive and promptly forgot all of his tricks in that environment. And that's when I realized there was more to a dog than I originally thought. So so you, Ruffy, Huncho, and the girl from across the street uh-huh. <laughs> went to went to obedience class, not training yep. class. Uh, yep. and, and and Huncho was seeing all of these dogs. It was a it was a new environment for for Huncho. Yep. And uh, of course it was all I could do not to keep Huncho from eating the other dogs. And the instructor was telling me many things to do to help prevent that. And they were rough things. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. He was my baby, you know, even though he was naughty. Well, let's say obnoxious, out of control. Loved him. But, uh, yeah. And then at that time, obedience classes ran about 16 weeks. And uh, at the end... We had a test, and the test was similar. It actually was the American Kennel Club Novice Obedience Trial. So when I took that test at the end of the course, much to my surprise, he was in first place. I never knew he was that good because I was too busy keeping him from eating the other dogs. But somehow or another, we pulled off first place, and then they immediately said, congratulations, Here's your blue ribbon. Will you come and be an instructor for us? 
So that was my sole preparation for being a dog training class instructor, having one dog that luckily earned a ribbon. That was it back then, Ryan. Was was that was that moment when you got that congratulations and the offer to come and teach classes? Was that a turning point for you? Was that kind of? Well, it went straight to my head, and uh, I jumped on the chance, and that was the launching pad. I've been kind of at it. Well, yes, I have been at it continuously ever since. I never gave it a break. Well, then let's uh, show some gratitude to. Ruffy and the girl across the street for inviting okay. you to the obedience <laughs> class. Yep. So you, you said you said it was the the class went for six weeks. Sixteen weeks. Sixteen weeks. So long. Uh, and then, so I'm curious because a lot of podcast guests, you, you you said there that some offerings were made to you about certain techniques you could apply to uh, help air quotes hunt show to fix Hancho, whatever we want yes, to say. Yes, yes, yes. And, and they were a little bit rough. Did you ever go down that, and I'm, I'm asking this because a lot of podcast guests have shared that stories of being crossover trainers. Did you ever go down that, air quotes again, traditional route? Or I you, did. You did? I did. I was a very young person, and the instructor was a senior person, and I was brought up in a family that encouraged me to respect her elders and I half-heartedly did a bit of jerking on a choke chain. And then I got rid of the choke chain and came in with a nylon collar, and the instructor immediately said, put your choke chain on or get out. So I came Ultimatum. to a, yeah, a crossroads. So eventually I quit that and uh, moved on. So what, what made you initially get rid of that choke chain? You, you just had that gut feeling that what you're doing was not right. Well, I'll just say one more thing, not to be disparaging of trainers in the old days. He said, let me show you. Fool that I was, I allowed him to take my dog. He marched right up to a wall, gave a hearty jerk. The dog bounced off the wall and then very timidly and precisely followed the trainer around the room. And I'm thinking to myself as a young person, this is not worth it. Yeah, he looked like he learned something, but I don't think I can do that effectively. And that was kind of the end. So just thinking back in our timeline, this is pre-90s, this stuff going on. Is it? Have, have I got that right? And yes. Can, so what, what happened after this? Where did we go in the 90s? Where did the 90s take Kateri Ryan? Well, at that time... I was reading a lot, trying to learn as much as I possibly could. There were not very many courses, camps, workshops, seminars. Uh, I, I got into the psychology papers, and I noticed that the psychologists often were disparaging of dog trainers at that time. And dog trainers didn't trust psychologists. And I thought, hmm, I noticed that... Um, Dog trainers said, give that psychologist a seven-month-old Labrador with a 70-year-old owner and see what he can do with that. And the psychologist's response was, give that trainer a rat in a Skinner box and see what the trainer can do with that. So I decided to meet that challenge. At that time, I was doing camps, uh, dog training camps. And uh, I was one of the first to do those, so I got lots of campers. There was no competition. I had a lot of people from overseas, and those people, of course, couldn't bring their dogs. Um, I went through a series of, well, let's get loner dogs, let's get uh, shelter dogs. And then I said, hold on, why not get rats and Skinner boxes for these people, for all of us that couldn't train a dog um, at camp. So I did that. I, of course, had connections with the psych lab at Washington State University. And in the summer, I was able to get loan of as many Skinner boxes, excuse me, operant conditioning chambers as uh, I wanted. And I was able to get the loan of as many rats as I wanted from lab animal resources. 
So I started training rats at camp and helping people train rats. And that was kind of the crossover into let's actually get some other species here and start training them by markers and positive reinforcement. So I love the the cre- creativity there <laughs> from uh, Ulfus creating the dog training camps, uh, then working with the, the loner dogs, the shouter dogs. Is, is it, you can kind of see the transition. You can kind of see your thinking progressing there, I think. Yeah, good. And so when you got these rats in these operant conditioning chambers, uh, did you share this with the community and the conversation between psychologists and trainers at the time? No, no, I would be way too shy to do that. It was just like a personal uh, thing that I wanted to do. To, uh, I shared it only with people that came to the workshops. That's all. And then you mentioned that you were the only one doing this at the time, no competition. So did word start getting out about Terry Ryan's rat training camps? They were dog training camps with a unit of rat training mixed in. I guess so. But I quickly got away from rats and moved on to different species. Is there any, any stories from that time? Because I imagine there was big, big learning curves going on for, for you, uh, how they work and for everyone at the camps. Is there any stories that stick out about funny things or uh, well, poignant moments? I had to keep in mind that rats were nocturnal animals and the camps were run during the daytime. So it was a steep learning curve, but in the end we got behavior and it encouraged me to explore this a little bit further. And what kind of behaviors were you training in those operant chambers at the time? Mostly just bar pressing, which is what the Operant conditioning chamber was set up to do for us. And then we moved on to other species. Uh, one of the ones that you're very well known for is chickens, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, yep. So bring it, bring us up to speed now. Or was there any other significant events? I mean, there's a big time period there. I appreciate that. Between the 90s and where we are now, or was it kind of just a natural, a natural progression of your business? And Well, it was growth? just me with a couple of my own dogs. Back then they were German Shepherds and then I moved into English Cocker Spaniels by way of retrievers. And having those dogs in competitive events uh, and offering classes for pet dogs and competitive people, uh, I also started judging competitive events. So that's kind of what was going on then. And so I have a question for you. If you could go back now as 2018 Terry Ryan and speak to the Terry Ryan that went uh, to the obedience class way back when, what, what might you say to that young Terry Ryan? Oh, I would say go get your master's degree and your PhD and then keep training tons and tons of dogs. And then possibly you might be ready if you take a master's in teacher education, you might be ready to be an instructor. P.S., you better get a veterinary degree while you're at it. Of course, I didn't do any of those things, but that's what I would do if I could go back, and that's what I tell young people. And what, why is that? What, why would you want to make that change? What is it about getting that academic? Probably because I don't have a Ph.D., and a lot of my friends do, and it kind of would be nice to have one. I've never felt handicapped, but I admire those that put the academic work behind their practical work. Well, there you go, everyone. If you're out there in a young stage of your career and you're not sure what to do, maybe some um, wise words there to to follow and to let them marinate in your young training minds. Uh, So before we move on, Terry, thank you for sharing all of that. Really enjoyed learning about your training odyssey, as I like to call it. Can you just share with everyone listening, like I said, before we move to the next question, where they can go now to, to find out more about you and find you online and get in touch, etc. Oh, the best way to get in touch with me would be through email or Facebook. I used to do um, blogs and I used to keep up my website 
I just don't do that anymore. People have to really look for me. I don't like looking at my own website. I don't do it myself anymore. I have a, an, an associate that keeps it up and I don't look at it because I'm afraid I'll find a mistake and then I'll get all grumpy. So I haven't been on my own website in years. I'm assuming it might be helpful. And I don't do blogs because I'm too lazy doing it to write about it, I guess. Too busy doing other things. But I sure do appreciate people that blog and people that do podcasts. Well, thank you for the uh, for the love and appreciation. So moving forward, Terry, I'd really like to build upon what you mentioned then when we were talking about your training odyssey. And this is chicken training camp. So we talked about dog training camps, rat training camps, uh, but now I want to talk about chicken training camps. Can you tell everyone listening a little bit more about what these are and your involvement in them? Okay. Well, actually in the beginning, they weren't chicken training camps. They were chickens replacing rats at a dog training camp. Um, The way that went about was Ingrid Kang Schallenberger who is a person that took over for Karen Pryor at Sea Life Park when Karen moved to Washington, also moved to Washington. And she called me up and said, I'm bored. I don't have any friends. I'm cold. And I said, poor Ingrid, what are you doing in two weeks? Nothing. I said, come to dog training camp. And she said, good, I'll be there. So she came. And uh, at the end of it, I said, Ingrid, did you have fun? She says, oh, yeah, yeah, Ingrid is from Scandinavia. And I said, did you enjoy what I did with rats? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, good, because I'd like you to come back next year and teach the other species unit for me. And she said, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that. And just like anyone that immediately says no, they're just the person for the job. Anyway, a little bit of arm twisting, and she she signed on. And I said, the only thing, Ingrid, is I want to move on from rats. Let's train something else. And she said, well, what? And I said, well, what about what about Oscars? Oscars are a fat little fish. They're very much like dogs. I love Oscars. But I couldn't get my head around everybody having a mason jar with an Oscar in it afterwards. What do we do with these little guys? So I said, Ingrid, what are we going to do? And she said, well, I raise finches. Well, finches don't eat enough, and they're awful tiny. And so we noodled around on that a little bit, and she said, what about chickens? I have just started a chicken yard. And I said, okay, if you want to do chickens, we'll do chickens. That's how I got into chicken training, just by default, passing the buck, shirking my duties, taking advantage of Ingrid. But but it was only a little unit. You know, we had many people in camp, but I wanted to keep the uh, instruction ratio instructor to teacher good. So we rotated among various topics and chicken training was one topic that people would rotate to for 50 minutes in a day. And so that chicken training 50 minute slot has now evolved into a couple of day workshop. Is that correct? Well, little by little, um, Ingrid got on to other things, and I found that me training an important unit like that at my own camp, I couldn't give it my full attention because I was busy making sure lunch was delivered and people were happy, so I needed someone else to do that for me. And then I remembered in the back of my psych book was the name Breland, and I remembered reading something about Breland. So I looked it up. And sure enough, the Brelands, Keller and Marion, who were B.F. Skinner's graduate students, eventually left academia and they opened up a training farm in Arkansas. And they trained acts for carnivals, stage, uh, TV commercials, government work. And uh, I got up the courage to call Marion Breland one day and I said, Hello, Ms. Breland. This is Terry Ryan. I live in Washington State. And I'm really always, I was taken by your work that I read in college, the Breland effect, for instance, instinctive drift. 
And I thought that was wonderful because that was kind of counter B.F. Skinner, but yet you were his graduate students. I kind of loved that. So I was buttering her up. And then I said, you know, I'm doing dog training classes in courses. And one of the units that everyone has a taste of is training chickens. And I would like someone with way more experience than I have to do that chicken training unit for me. How about it? Can I hire you to do it? Oh, no, no, dear. What a good idea. Good for you for doing that. No, no, I'm retired. I can't do it. Uh, but keep up the good work. That's really clever. You should keep continue to do that. Anyway, long story short, I wore her down, twisted her arm, and she and then her second husband, Bob Bailey, came to... Uh, my next chicken camp and taught that unit for me. Wow, what a great story. And two, two parts in that story, uh, you were told no. <laughs> and with Ingrid, you said that's when you knew that she was the right person for the job because she said no. Can you explain this a little bit more? What did you mean by that? Often people that know what they're doing are kind of shy about it and don't put themselves out there. And sometimes experiences told me that people, some of them that put themselves out there, really don't know as much as others if you start to investigate a little bit. And having worked with Ingrid, I knew she was the person for the job. She was just shy. And so you were, you were good at convincing people <laughs> to um, come, and, come and do these chicken camps with you, which we're all grateful for in 2018. Uh, interesting, I haven't thought about it that before. So thanks for sharing that little tidbit. Huh. And so can you explain, I mean, that, that's such a great story. Bob Bailey um, and Marion came and taught that next chicken year for you. Did yes. they come back again or did you? what happened after that? Well, they came. They did a great job. I learned a tremendous amount from Marion. We used to call her Mouse. She passed in 2001, but I was fortunate enough to have a lot of direct contact with her before then. And I was very, very fortunate. She taught me a lot about being a trainer and a lot about being a person, a woman. So I'm forever in debt to Marion, and I'm standing on her shoulders. I learned about keeping records. I learned about rater reinforcement. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing when I started rat and chicken training, and I feel like they taught me so much that I'm now able to benefit from and share with others. Well, nice, nice shout out to one of your mentors there. Always I love when we get an opportunity to, do, opportunity to do that. And so you said that she taught you about records and rates of reinforcement. What, what kind of stories can you share that led to you learning these things? Um, in the beginning, it was me observing them teach. And I thought, aha, I should do that when I go back to teaching this unit. Well, I was so impressed with them, I didn't go back to teaching that unit in the camps. I did more arm twisting, and for the next three camps or so, Bob and Marion did that unit. And then I be began to feel left out because all of my students were getting this great experience, and I'm getting lunch ready. So I invited them to come. By that time, we were living in Squim, Washington. We had moved away from the university area. I asked them to come out and do a private course for my staff and myself. And I just loved it. And then I put them up to coming out on a regular basis and doing chicken courses for us. Well, that grew into them enjoying doing it, and they started doing their own chicken courses for dog people. They did their own in Arkansas, and I sent all of my staff and myself to Arkansas because it was so much fun, and I kept learning more and more and more. After that, uh, that time, Marion passed away, and Bob kind of was out of the picture for a little bit, and uh, we were in touch, and I said, Bob, why don't you carry on the tradition and come out to Squim, where I live, where my training center is, and start doing your Arkansas chicken camps for me. I'll hire you to do it. I'll provide the chickens. I'll make you tea. I'll 
do whatever we need to do to keep this going. And he did for four years. He came to SQUIM and did those for me until the last year when I started uh, making plans for his retirement party. And we had a heck of a good time, four piece band, lots of good food to eat. And he retired. And then the next year he surfaced again. I think he's one of those people that will never retire. However, we had a good time at his first retirement party. <laughs> it's fun. You get to have multiple retirement parties now. Yep. And so nowadays you're you're running the camps, or you're I am. running. Yes. So you're still. Are you still doing the yearly camp, or you, is this is it more of you traveling internationally and nationally now doing the chicken seminar? It's in the beginning. I would schedule them and do them on a regular basis, and I was so busy with other things. Chicken training really captured my imagination, but I was doing other things as well. So then it went to, if somebody, I'll offer them once or twice a year, but if somebody invites me or asks me to do it, then I'll do it. So nowadays it's more of, you ask me to do a chicken camp, you do all the hard work like advertising, getting the venue, and I'll show up, I'll walk on and do it for you. And that's been a lot of fun. I've been invited to many, many really great places around the world, made tons of new friends, and uh, that's pretty much where I am now. You ask me, and I might do it for you. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've earned it. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and so can you explain to everyone listening, what, what is the benefit of going to train a chicken in, in one of these situations? Like what, what can you expect, and why is it such a great way to learn? Well, back when I was attending or teaching or hosting dog training seminars and workshops. I myself and others attending would feel like, oh, that might be a good idea, but I'm, I don't want to try it because if my dog doesn't get it, it might ruin, I might lose my entry fee next week because it's going to mess up my dog. And I don't want to risk what I'm already doing. Some of this stuff is pretty weird, this clicker stuff. And so I feel one of the big benefits is it's not your dog. It's my chicken, and you can gamble on that and then step back and say, will this work for me with my dog? And then my job, of course, is to make that leap, that lateral thinking between this works with the chicken, it will work with your dog, and this is how it will work. So that's kind of where I am as far as people not looking into their dog's big brown eyes and saying, do I really want to do this? Uh, this is strange. Um, and leaving their ego home, because especially in the early, earlier days, no one actually had trained a chicken. But in dog training workshops, most people have trained a dog, and they've read dog books, and they're experienced, and they have a mentor. Well, they could walk into the chicken training without ever having done it, and so don't have to prove anything. Everyone shows up, at, especially at that time, at a chicken training workshop on an equal level. They don't have to, uh, they can leave their baggage behind because there's no baggage in chicken workshops. I love it. And yeah. so looking at the time, we should move on to the next question, but let's just remind people if wherever they are in the world, uh, they are interested in hosting one of these chicken camps. Uh, once again, the best way to reach out and ask you about this would be Facebook? Or my email. I do rely on email. Okay, cool. That e yeah. Yeah, spell it out for everyone now. Yeah, sure. And I answer promptly. It's my displacement activity when I'm supposed to be writing this darn book I'm supposed to be doing. Anyway, it's Terry, T-E-R-R-Y at Legacy Canine. That's L-E-G-A-C-Y-C-A-N-I-N dot -E com. Perfect. And we will link to your Facebook and provide your email address in the write-up for this podcast as well. So if you didn't have a pen and paper ready then, um, you can jump to the Animal Training Academy website, find this podcast episode, and we'll have the information for you there so you can get in touch with Terry that way. Okay. 
For the next question, Terry, I really want to uh, talk about something which I know that uh, my members of Animal Training Academy, the members of Animal Training Academy, uh, often talk about and are excited to hear your offerings about in this podcast, and that is being the best instructors that we can be. Because a lot of people that listen to this podcast are in that position of helping clients and running classes. Could you share some offerings from your experience about helping human learners succeed? Well, yep. There's a a lot of considerations there. One is that in order to help dogs, which all of us, many of us, enter into this field because of our love of dogs and our wanting to help them, invariably, to get to the dog, you're going to go through a person, whether it's the dog's owner or the people at the shelter. I view dog training classes kind of like being a tour guide. If you've ever been to a foreign country, everything is strange, new, different, and you don't know a lot about that country. But if you hook up with a tour guide, a good tour guide, that person will be interesting, warm, welcoming, explain things to you, show you things that will appeal to you, and keep that going while you're on this new adventure. So I kind of look at a dog training class instructor as a tour guide. The the traits being that you mentioned they're interesting, warm, welcoming, and show you things that appeal to you. So can you unpack that a little bit more? How do do we develop those traits? What, how do we be interesting, warm, and welcoming? Like, can you, can you give some tips and input on that? Well, some people are just born into it. That's their personality. And others need to work on it. One of the ways to work on it is to think about an activity that you participated in and what was your instructor like? What made you happy to go back to that class? What made your learning clear? How did your instructor break it down so that you could be successful? Success breeds success. If your student, the human, is successful, of course, the dog will be successful. Then they'll both be happy. And of course, then I'll be successful, which makes me happy and makes me want to go on and continue to work with people and dogs. So it kind of has to do with framing your messages so that they're successful and try hard not to talk down to people, although it's really easy to do so. Because at this point, you may think you know it all. There was a point in my life when I knew it all. And that was about 45 years ago. And now I just know more of what I don't know that keeps me going. I had all the answers, uh, Ryan, about 45 years ago. I knew what was happening. But of course, I didn't because I didn't explore. A good instructor needs to be a lateral thinker they need to have a toolbox of different ways to present an exercise to see which one is accepted by both the dog and the human learners most readily. So when you say lateral thinking, what do you mean by this? Well, it's easy to look at a book and see a method to get a dog to walk nicely at your side. That might be the method that you think is the best, it's worked for you, but it might not work for your students. So you have to be observant, see how they're doing. And if it looks like the human's not getting it or the dog's not getting it, say, well, why don't we try this and show an alternative way? Or how does this appeal to you? Do you think your dog is understanding this method better? And then we go at it as a me, you, and your dog kind of a thing, not a me, to you and your dog. We kind of work at it together that way. And I take some of my leads in presenting a different way to train that exercise. I take my lead from the owner, the human end of the leash. So is, is being a lateral thinker is another way of saying it. You, you mentioned earlier framing your messages so they are successful. Is that what you meant by that or did that I have mean, a different meaning? Well, I guess what I'm thinking 
by that term, which was coined, by the way, by Edward de Bono. That's a good resource if you're interested in really delving into lateral thinking, Edward de Bono. Uh, To me, I've been to lateral thinking workshops. Of course, those were designed for corporate attendees, for his people. The people that went to his workshops were people like, he was a problem solver for the likes of Bill Gates, Walt Disney Studios. But then I show up, little Terry Dog Trainer, and what I took away from it was have more than one way to do anything. Have your favorite way, the way you're comfortable with. Try that out first, but look left and right and see what the people around you are doing and see if they're struggling and then suggest in a positive way, why don't we try this? Would you be willing to try a different approach? And that's kind of my interpretation of the term lateral thinking. It's lots of tools in your instructors and training toolbox. So could you say that by attending a lateral thinking workshop by Edward de Bono and Slash or his team, you were practicing lateral thinking? By... Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and and then so to transcend this and, and think, uh, is it meta and think bigger, um, is, is that lateral thinking that you are talking about here with regards to instructing, uh, but you demonstrated it through doing things like attending a lateral thinking workshop. I'm going to say lateral thinking way too many times here. But is, is that lateral thinking approach just been something that you've applied throughout your career? And do you think that that has led to you being successful? Well, I think I started out being stuck in a rut and teaching people and dogs the way I was taught and finding it wasn't working for everyone, Uh, noticing a dropout rate, and that to me is telling. I didn't want dropouts in my class, so I changed things up and reduced that dropout rate. Um, I think another thing that we as instructors need to do is to look out there in your community and see what's needed not what you think you should teach or what you think is needed. I came on to that early because since the very early 1990s, probably late 1980s, I've been going abroad to teach. And to do a pet dog training class in Squim, Washington, at the foothills of the Olympic Mountains, a uh, very low population. What those people need that come to my class, far different one from the students in Tokyo, Japan need. So I've had to be lateral thinking and adjust even my curriculum to make it suit the people that I'm teaching. And because I do do instructors workshops around the world, I have to know the various cultures and see what's needed and then tweak my workshops and my advice according to what they really will find helpful in their particular communities. All right, going abroad will definitely get you literally thinking about different ways to do things. Ryan, it also makes me a better dog trainer because I don't speak many of the languages and I have to be good at nonverbal communication to pick up on what the people are thinking and what I want to get across to the people. Yes, I have interpreters, but thinking of it, that's what we're doing when we're doing dog training. The dog doesn't start out with our language, so it's up to us to totally understand as well, as much as possible, understand their language. And uh, I make that comparison, and I think trying my best to communicate with ESL, English as a Second Language, or people that don't speak English at all has made me more empathetic and a better trainer of dogs. Well, I never need more reasons to want to travel, but now I have one, so (laughs) thank you for that. Um, And and some other things you injected in there, so you injected these when you were discussing how to be a lateral trainer, but I was just making note of your language. You used language like... When you're talking to clients or people in your class, 
ask, why don't we try this? Or how does this appeal to you? Or would you be willing to try a different approach? How important do you think your language is and, and how you suggest these different things to people is? People are very protective of their dogs. And they, I fall into that category. If you even do something like call my dog a him and it's a her, that irritates me. It shouldn't, of course. But the way you regard their dogs, I think, will make an impact on how they accept your message. So I try my best to see what they're thinking, to figure out how they would like to approach it, to give them uh, a menu of ways to do something, and then guide them through that. We can't be too, to use an American term, wishy-washy. We have to help them and guide them, but we want to give a little bit of leeway for them to give input. It's their dog. If their heart isn't into the method, they may try the method. They might try that method, but if their heart isn't in it, they're not going to pull it off. They need to be in it at the ground level, believe in what they're doing. That's what I think anyway. It's just me guessing, Ryan. Well, we appreciate you guessing, and I think you might have potentially come up with the name of the podcast there, Terry. Um, We can't be too wishy-washy. Give them a menu of ways to do things. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) Um, So that comes back to your, or do full circle here and go back to your tour guide analogy. Um, That comes back to being interesting, warm, welcoming, and showing them things that appeal to them. That, is that the lateral thinking side when you mentioned that right at the start or is that kind of giving them a menu of ways to do things so it's just trying to find what works for that individual treating the trainer the client as an individual like we do our animals well an example would be something that I call the hook when I introduce a new exercise I often pose it as a question how would you like a dog that would do this or something like Does your dog ever run away from you instead of towards you when you're calling him? Would you like to change that? And I think instead of just saying, and now we're going to start working on the recall. For one thing, recall isn't a common term for many people. So I like to put it into more user-friendly terms and terms that will perk them up and say, huh, well, my dog doesn't do that, but my neighbor's dog does, so I better listen. Yeah, their dog probably does it too, and uh, we can help you with that. So you're making the menus on the items sound more delicious. I guess that's right. I guess that's right. K-I-S-S, keep it short and sweet. Nice, I like that. And am I correct that you have a book on the subject? K-I-S-S? On uh, instructing. Yes, I do. <laughs> on kissing. I, yeah. No, <laughs> I don't know about that one. Not my field. Um, about 12 years ago, I wrote a book called Coaching People to Train Their Dogs. I revised it a couple of years later. It actually, it was just another edition with some corrections in the veterinary chapter. And I'm in the process right now. I wanted to update it. And in doing so, I found out that it needed to be an entirely different book. So much has changed in 10 years and so much more that I've learned that the dogs have taught me, that clients have taught me. Uh, I've learned to put things in ways that are more easily processed by people. So I actually reformatted the whole thing, took out some things that I don't think are as important to leave room for new things that I feel are more important. So I don't know when that'll come out. Probably next year. Takes a while. Well, exciting. We're all going to look forward to that. Uh, And talking about books, I have your your other book right here on my table. And I did look at your your, uh, three showers game that you recommended to me. And also me and Phoebe have been playing the uh, nose work games that you sent through to me. I've got my bottle of vanilla here as well. Uh Ah, yes. That I went out and got yesterday. But another book and and topic that you are interested in and have wrote about is gamifying your dog training. Can you talk about this and and why you think there's value in playing games with our dogs as a way of teaching them? Well, a number of reasons. One is selfish. 
in the process of inventing new games uh, helps me avoid instructor burnout because there's always something new to do at the next class. Um, gamification is a trend that's being picked up on now the last four or five years. It's throughout early childhood education. It's in e-learning. It's in adult education. So why not have it be part of dogs education? I've been doing games with dogs since the 70s. And I actually wrote a couple of little booklets back in the 70s and 80s on that. One uh, was entitled Life Beyond Block Healing. Back in the early days, a dog training class consisted of forward, halt, left turn, right turn, fast pace. And that was a bit boring and the dogs thought so too. So I would break that traditional uh, format into a, a variety of games. Um, over the years, I became more um, organized at that. And both of those little booklets that I did many years ago went out of print. So I decided to write another book. And again, I got into it and it sounds like a book to teach you games to present in a dog training class. And it is. However, covertly, it's also an instructor's book because each game that I present not only talks about what dog would benefit from it, how to present it, but also additional information, you know, value added, uh, what you can bring up, a, a one minute point you can bring up while playing this game that will be valuable and will uh, help in other aspects of the training. So each game has how to do it, what you need to do it, which dogs would be appropriate because not all games are appropriate for all dogs. Um, that was kind of my format for this. And so you said you were creating these games to prevent uh, trainer burnout or instructor burnout. So you've been doing it since the 70s? Yeah, pretty much. And uh, other people are doing it, and we trade games, and sometimes they'll tell me something that they say, sorry, Terry, I stole your game, but I changed it, and they tell me about it, and I'll say, sorry, I'm going to steal that game back because I like your version better. So it's just a, you know... You can make any game a lower skilled game or a higher skill game. And my games are not competitive, they're instructional. However, many people like a touch of competition. So in each game, I also indicate how you can make it a competitive event if that's what you want. Mostly I'm pitching the games to give an opportunity to teach fluency exercises in a core behavior instead of over and over again for instance sit i'll turn that core behavior into a variety of games which makes it less boring and more everyday application so we might have a sit that looks good in class but we need fluency at that sit and i devise games to produce that fluency and the book's called Gamify Your Dog Training. And is the best place to get this dog wise? Should I link to dog wise on the podcast right up, Terry? Yeah, those are the people that published it and put up with my tardy meeting of deadlines. And they're great people. Yeah, dog wise. All right, so I'll put a link up in the podcast right up to Gamify, Gamify Your Dog Training. And you can find Terry's other books over at Dog Wise as well. Thank you so much for all of this, Terry. Sadly, we are nearly at the end, but that's okay because we're also heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show, and this is story time. Terry, could you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training animals, working with dogs so far, and ancestral chickens or rats and anything else you've worked with, and share some of the important lessons you've learned along the way. Oh, well, the one that comes to mind is after German Shepherds and Retrievers, I really wanted an English Cocker Spaniel, mostly because they're so cute. And my husband wasn't sure we needed a frou-frou dog. Um, 
my good friend who is a dyed-in-the-wool shepherd person said, why would you get one of those when there are perfectly good German shepherd puppies out there? And I said to him, because I want to try something small and sporting. He said, just go get a Corvette. But that's not what I had in mind. So anyway, throwing a minor temper tantrum, I convinced the family that we were getting an English cocker and uh, started training that nine-week-old puppy to be house trained. We don't potty indoors, we potty outdoors. So I did it the same way I did all the other dogs. Um, For the majority of my life, I didn't have a dog door. And so the dogs would go to the door and that would be, they would sit, that would be my cue to open the door for them and they'd go out into the fenced yard. Since then, I've become a lot more lazy, and I have a dog door going out into a fenced yard. But so the cocker, you know how you do with puppies. After every nap, after every drink of water, after every play session, out you go to the potty area. And at that time, it was open the sliding glass door, step on to our covered deck, go down three steps, turn right, and that's the prepared dog potty area. So many times a day, that's what we would do. We got her in October in a year that was very, very snowy. So same routine, open the door, go with her off the deck, down the steps into the potty area and tell her how great she is when she potties. And back we both go in, freezing, to be done again. Um, Snowy days. So it usually didn't snow under the deck, but one day the wind blew and there was snow under the roof of the deck. The deck was covered with snow. So time to potty, I opened the door. She stepped out and she squatted right on the other side of the threshold and she pottied right on the deck. And I didn't, I didn't get it. I thought, lapse of memory? What's going on here? Do you, are you ill? Uh, so I really didn't know. I was too dumb to realize at that time what was going on, I guess. And of course, you've guessed it. What I had trained her to do over in that potty area of the yard was to potty on snow. It had had nothing to do with location. It had to do with snow. So when she saw the snow right on the other side of the threshold, that's exactly what she did. She did what I had trained her to do which is potty on snow. I didn't get it. So that's a case where what you're teaching your dog is not always what your dog is learning. Yeah. That's my story, Ryan. I think you've just shared with me one of my new favorite stories. <laughs> I love that. And then spring came and the snow started going, <laughs> receding farther and farther into the fenced yard. And yeah, I had a struggle to... Uh, try to teach her exactly what I had in mind to begin with, which I had failed in her early childhood. But it all came together. And we lived happily ever after, pottying in the right place. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful story. And um, we're glad that you got uh, the dog instead of the convertible. And also <laughs> also nice to see that your, your learning history um, maintained throughout your life. Because I remember you sharing with us at the start of the podcast episode that you threw a t- temper tantrum to get your first dog and here you are throwing a temper tantrum to get your a mi- dog a year minor, minor one. Minor, <laughs> minor. One. Right, so people had learned to um, give in. I'm joking. Me too. <laughs> that, of course, you didn't fail to disappoint with that wonderful story. This does bring us now to our final question, Terry. Yeah. Could, could you please take us all into the future? and share with us what you would like to see happen happen uh, in the dog and animal training world over the next five to ten years. Okay, so globally, I think we are on a trend that needs to be continued, and I'm hopeful and have reason to believe that will be continued, and that is getting together and sharing information and not thinking, oh, they do that in South Korea, We don't do that in America, and maybe you should, and maybe there are reasons you could do it, and to just be more open-minded as we are 
a lot more open-minded now and a lot more embracing of other opinions than we were decades ago. I want to see that continued. As far as my own goal, it would be sitting in a rocking chair with my dog. That's it. So with regards to your goal first, are you going to be able to do that? Can you say no moving forward to training opportunities or are you going to be training for as long as you possibly can? I haven't been really good at saying no, but I'm starting to get better at that. So, yeah, maybe I'll do half rocking chair, half instructing and teaching. I like it. And the other thing that you said you'd like to see is, can can we reframe that or tell me if uh, this doesn't work for you just to see more lateral thinking then well it could be it could be lateral thinking i think that's going to be a big plus for any person trainer or instructor and one of the keys to lateral thinking is to find out what other people are doing and fortunately now we don't have an excuse not to find out things We have workshops, we have camps, we have all kinds of uh, online opportunities. And I would say, go to it, tune in, even though you don't like the name of the person on it, or you don't like the methods that you think are being proposed, I say tune in anyway. And then make up your mind that you don't like this person or you don't like the method. I think we can stand to learn what we don't like and confirm that, and then move on to more techniques that will be useful to the dogs and the clients in the future. Yeah, Ryan, you could call it lateral thinking if you wanted to. Go ahead. Well, I think I have to um, fill in some knowledge gaps there about my understanding of lateral thinking, (laughs) Um, but I'm liking the concept, and that's going to be a reinforcing word for me. I'm going to have endorphin releases when I hear (laughs) lateral thinking uh, moving forward and try to expand my understanding there. Thank you so much for sharing everything today, Terry. And before we wrap up, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening We really appreciate you taking time to come on the show today to catch up with me uh, about a month ago for Bill helping us sort out all the technical stuff and getting the computer working, uh, for firing emails back and forth to me, getting a buyer ready and everything. We really appreciate you making time for this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure. And pleasure is all ours. And, of course, everyone listening out there, We really appreciate you tuning in today as well. If you have enjoyed this episode and you are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, gamified, choice-rich ways, and as mentioned at the start of the episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.com www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behaviour geeks. There is something there for absolutely everyone. We're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We will wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening everyone and you'll hear from us again soon.